guys, it's Kaylee and welcome back to Being a Suit where every week I talk about sustainability because I dream of a world where we do not live in complete delusion about the scale of the climate challenge. Before we dive into the video, you may notice that I got a new plant and that is because my life is truly a constant experiment in finding out which plants can actually survive in this apartment. So rest in peace to old hanging plant. Welcome to new hanging plant. May you live long and prosper. <laughs> All right, let's get back to business. This week, the International Energy Agency launched a new report titled Net Zero by 2050, which as you can probably guess, is a scenario analysis of what it would take to reach a state of net zero by 2050. Now these scenarios are developed all the time. So why am I specifically talking about this one? Well, this particular IEA release sent shockwaves through the fossil fuel industry and fossil fuel producing nations because of one specific line in the report. And that line was, there is no need for investment in new fossil fuel supply. The IEA has never asserted something this bold. So today I wanted to dive into what exactly net zero is and the key findings behind this IEA scenario. As always, I create a blog post with links to my research, resources where you can learn more, and one or two organizations you may choose to follow or support if this topic is of particular interest to you. You can find that in the description box below. Okay, without further ado, let's get into it. Net zero refers to a commitment to completely negate CO2 emissions by balancing the emissions of carbon dioxide produced with their removal or elimination. If we look at this a little closer, there are really two crucial components to achieving net zero. First is mitigating or lowering the number of emissions produced globally so that we are trying to produce as few emissions as possible. And second is the deployment of solutions that offset or balance the emissions that are still produced through things like tree planting, carbon capture and storage, or direct CO2 air capture and storage. In other words, finding ways to remove the small amount of emissions that were not possible to eliminate through mitigation. To date, 32 countries, making up 70% of global emissions, have made commitments to achieving net zero, some as early as 2035, like Finland, and some as late as 2060, like China and Kazakhstan. But the vast, vast majority of countries have pledged net zero by 2050. Only six countries have actually legislated their commitment to net zero. That's Sweden, the UK, France, Denmark, New Zealand, and Hungary, but it is quite a popular political commitment right now. While the general consensus in the climate community is that countries committing to net zero is a positive and necessary development in the fight against climate change, there is still some very valid criticism of the principle. As I just mentioned, the net dimension of the word implies both reducing emissions and offsetting or eliminating the remaining emissions. And many thought leaders on this topic believe that governments and industry are putting too much emphasis on the offsetting side of the equation, basically giving the world a carte blanche to continue producing emissions at a nearly unchecked rate while believing that future technologies like direct CO2 air capture will come in and save us later. Some have gone so far as to call it a dangerous trap because of its focus on this technological salvation and its potential to reduce the sense of urgency that's needed so that we take immediate action now. So now that you kind of have the basics on net zero and some of its criticism, let's move into the IEA's most recent analysis. The IEA is an intergovernmental organization, meaning it's made up of countries as their members. I say this to point out that it's not an independent climate think tank or an activist organization. In fact, it's really always been known for very rigorous analysis and in my opinion, has never been seen as radical or brash. It's kind of always been more of this middle of the line, realistic policy recommendation type entity. And this is why their new net zero by 2050 report was a bit of a shock to the system. It is just so much more ambitious than some of their even recent sustainability scenarios. 
And more importantly, it really lays out the reality of the massive challenge we face as a global society and specifically the extreme systemic transformation that's needed to limit global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. So let's dive into some of the details of the report. The first disclaimer to make is that this report is obviously focused on the energy system, given that it is created by the International Energy Agency. But of course, energy production is responsible for 72% of all global emissions, so it is the biggest dragon to slay when it comes to the climate fight. It's also important to note that this report is a scenario, and scenarios work by taking an end goal, in this case, achieving net zero by 2050, and charting one or more paths to achieve that particular goal. Scenarios have been very popular in the energy space for a long time, and they are referenced frequently in business and government policy and decision making. This stems back to the 1970s when the energy industry was completely blindsided by the rise of environmentalism as well as the OPEC cartel. This spurred the energy company Shell and others to create a scenarios department that analyzed and built possible visions of the future to aid in business decision making. Scenarios have remained a very popular piece in this space ever since, and there are a number of scenarios that already exist that are related to the energy system and climate change from a range of organizations, including the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Shell, and the World Energy Council, and many, many more. All scenarios are based on assumptions and parameters, and the IEA's Net Zero by 2050 roadmap is no exception. The first big parameter or constraint is an assumption around our global carbon budget. It is estimated that to achieve a 1.5 degree C level of warming, the carbon budget that the planet has left is 500 gigatons of CO2. This means that we could not emit more than 500 gigatons of CO2 if we want to hit that level of 1.5 degrees Celsius ever. You know, 500 gigatons, that's the budget. This scenario that the IEA produced would use up 450 gigatons of CO2, leaving an additional 50-ish gigatons for emitters like land use and forestry, so basically things that are outside of the energy system. The IEA scenario is also built on three fundamental principles or assumptions. The first is it uses technology neutrality, meaning that they chose technologies based on their costs, readiness, country and market conditions, and trade-offs with wider societal goals. So they didn't preference certain technologies, they looked at those dimensions. Second, it assumes universal international cooperation in which all countries contribute to net zero with an eye to a just transition. And just transition basically means achieving the environmental objectives of limiting climate change, while also considering human objectives like jobs, economic opportunity, and energy access at the same time. And they also note that advanced economies should be taking charge and leading. And the third and final parameter they plan for is an orderly transition that seeks to minimize stranded assets wherever possible while ensuring energy security and minimizing volatility in energy markets. Stranded assets are basically infrastructure and projects that already exist and are at risk of being stranded or not utilized because of climate or other considerations, even if they still have useful life. So a good example here would be a coal plant, which could be at risk of being a stranded asset if coal is banned in a country, for example. Building the scenario based on these principles ensures that it is addressing societal concerns like job and economic activity and energy access for all. And in fact, the IEA even states that this particular roadmap would boost global GDP, create millions of jobs, provide universal access to energy by 2030, and avoid millions of premature deaths due to air pollution. They state that this scenario would support an economy 40% larger than we have today and a planet with nearly 2 billion more people living on it. They state further that this pathway is designed to maximize technical feasibility, cost effectiveness, and social acceptance while ensuring continued economic growth and secure energy supplies. 
I say all of this because these are all the criticism scenarios like this get. So they, they built that thinking in when they were developing it. The roadmap itself is structured around 400 milestones that are laid out in five year increments. They say this is what needs to be achieved between now and 2050. And so starting in 2020, 2025, 2030, here are the milestones that need to happen so that we know what immediate actions need to be taken now. I really can't stress enough how transformational the scenario that they have laid out really is. So let's look at what the transformed energy system of 2050 would look like according to this particular IEA scenario. So first, the world would electrify almost everything and would completely phase out use of the internal combustion engine. The reason for the particular focus on electricity is that it is easier to make electricity green than it is to make transport fuels like gasoline and diesel green. Electrons can be produced from such a wide variety of sources like solar, wind, nuclear, hydro, etc. Whereas transport fuels are mostly confined to the petroleum industry and to a lesser extent to biofuels and hydrogen. So this is why electrifying as much as possible is a crucial component to a clean energy future. Next, the world would suspend investment in new fossil fuel production and add carbon mitigation technologies or energy efficiency to all existing assets. So this could include things like carbon capture and storage on coal plants, for example. After this, we would massively scale up renewables so that they make up 90% of global electricity generation. And specifically, we would increase wind and solar to be almost 70% of global electricity by 2050. To put this in perspective, right now, wind and solar currently make up about 10% of the global electricity mix. Nuclear energy would also grow, but not to the same extent as renewables. We would enhance energy efficiency, starting with new buildings, vehicles, appliances, industry, and gradually retrofit or replace all the older versions of these things. We would then transition to sustainable bioenergy by moving off of traditional solid fuels, which are mostly used for cooking and heating in developing countries. And we would also begin using biofuel for low emissions fuels for planes, ships, and other forms of transportation. We would deploy carbon capture utilization and storage or CCUS to existing energy assets and industries where emissions are hardest to reach. An example here would be cement. It's very hard to reduce emissions in that production. And we would support the scaling of low emissions hydrogen production and enable some CO2 to actually be removed directly from the atmosphere. We would use hydrogen to fill the gaps where electricity cannot easily or economically replace fossil fuels, including hydrogen-based fuels for ships and planes, as well as hydrogen in heavy industries like steel and chemicals. And importantly, we would encourage behavioral change amongst populations, particularly in advanced economies, such as replacing car trips with walking, cycling, or public transport, or foregoing long haul flights. In the world, according to this scenario, renewables would make up two thirds of the global energy supply, nuclear would make up about 10%, and fossil fuels would make up only approximately 20%. The IEA sees employment and clean energy increasing by 14 million jobs and falling by 5 million jobs in the fossil fuel industry. As expected, and I'm sure as you can guess, the IEA net zero by 2050 roadmap has received a lot of backlash by fossil fuel producing countries, companies, and industry groups. Japan and Australia have already publicly said that they will continue fossil fuel investment. Norway, which is usually seen as quite a climate progressive state despite its fossil fuel production, defended its oil production as the lowest emission fossil fuel for Europe. OPEC said that the report would cause price volatility. The International Gas Union claimed the scenario would lead to massive energy insecurity all over the world, and the World Coal and Nuclear Associations both called the report impractical and unrealistic. What I have found interesting is that there has been a lot of additional commentary also pointing to the potential implications of this roadmap on financing the energy industry. Big banks are increasingly seeing fossil fuel investment as risky given the transition that's underway, and some feel 
that this could potentially be a tipping point where financiers really start to back away from fossil fuel industry for the risks to their future returns. I mean, it's to be seen. It's all speculation at this point. All of this backlash, it really isn't surprising. It's always hard to envision a world that isn't like our current one. And many of these industries that just have so much power now are seeing themselves being threatened. But this is the reality of the scale of the transformation that is required if we do want to stay in that 1.5 to 2 degree C scenario. Finally, to close, I spent some time at the beginning talking about the skepticism around the concept of net zero, and I want to come back to that. Remember that the criticism of that concept stems from the belief that it leads to inaction because of its reliance on future technologies to swoop in and save us. Well, in my reading of the IEA's roadmap, I think that potentially this could be an antidote to that doubt because of its huge focus on emission reductions right now and utilizing technologies that already exist. It lays out actions needed today, in five years, in 10 years, etc., and it doesn't give the impression that we can just deal with it in 2050 and continue as we are now. Some of the more nascent technologies like CCUS, direct air capture, and hydrogen are included in the roadmap, but an analysis by Dr. Simon Evans compared the IEA scenario with the IPCC's 1.5 degree pathway and found that it called for much lower fossil fuel use, much higher renewable energy deployment, specifically wind and solar, less carbon capture and storage, and less bioenergy, which points to, again, that it's, it might be a good antidote to some of the criticism of, hey, this can just come in later and save us. As I said at the top, scenarios really are just potential pathways. They are one route to get to a destination, but in my opinion, this IEA pathway did something that was very necessary and made it clear that business as usual just will not get us there and that continual investment in new fossil fuel development is not aligned to a climate sensitive future. This is quite a big development and something I think we should be watching very carefully. And that's it. That's all I have for you today. As always, thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to check out the blog post if you want more information or to continue learning about this topic. If you learned something in this video, give it a like. And if you made it all the way to the end, comment which energy technology you feel is the most important for a sustainable energy future to confuse everyone else who didn't make it this far. That's it for now. See you in the next one. And until then, keep fighting the good fight. Bye.